Okay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, so today we have uh, Jens, uh, Jens Fischer uh, from University of Toulouse and University of Potsdam with a talk about social conflict uh, with ex exclusion and a link. Uh, I think the speaker, speaker will explain more detailly what it is a social conflict in mathematics or how to model it with mathematics. <laughs> okay, now let's go. Thank you. Uh, let's share my screen rapidly. So, oh no. so uh, can you see the presentation? Everything is uh, all right? Yes, yes, everything is okay. Perfect. And so, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for letting me speak today. Um, yeah, my name is Jens Fischer. I am associate to the University of Toulouse and to the University of Potsdam, and my research is supported by the French-German University as well. So there's a collaboration between the two. And what I'm focusing on are so-called opinion dynamic models, uh, social conflict models, and everything that basically had a very big rush in the past years in mostly the social sciences in the context of agent-based models. And I try to find a link to mathematical tools to analyze these models rigorously. Um, sure, the, the name social conflict is a bit provocative, um, but it's a, it's a term that can be found in the social sciences just to describe the changes in relationships in a population. And what I'm mostly focusing on is to consider these changes in social network models. So models which are based on some sort of dynamic on graphs um, where the edges describe relationships between individuals and the individuals are represented by the nodes. Usually in the application later on, these graphs are huge. So most of the time, the, the analysis is based on population limits like, like um, <clears throat> hydrodynamic limits where the number of individuals goes to infinity. In my case, I'm more interested in the combinatorial part, so in explicit solutions um, based on some sort of uh, combinatorial uh, objects. And in particular for this talk, I will focus on a very specific model to illustrate what I've been working on and to demonstrate that there are tools which are quite powerful and nonetheless quite approachable from a mathematical point of view, even when we stay in a finite realm. And so the model I'm going to consider is a discrete time model on a discrete space which works as follows. In this example, we have four individuals linked by four relationships where the edges represent the relationships and <clears throat> the vertices, the individuals. And now we proceed as follows. In every time step, we draw first one edge uniformly among the existing edges. For example, this blue one, and then we delete it. So we remove it from the graph and then we draw one of the possible edges which are adjacent to either the one vertex which was connected to, to the previous edge or the other one. So in this case, it was one and three which were connected. And so we draw a new edge which is either connected to three or one also with the possibility to recreate the same edge. That's a model that is um, motivated by what we have seen in social networks and Facebook data, Twitter data, or which has been observed before, that these relationships just change on a larger time scale like that. And this approaches more or less the, the dynamics we can see in, in social networks. So it seems to be a reasonable model we call this change in the network um, 
S. So this will be our reference model. And now the question is, how do we analyze this? What can we actually do if we wonder about a long time behavior of the model, conversion speeds? Do we have some sort of um, equilibrium distribution? What can we actually do? And uh, yeah. so uh, in this case, um, in the end, we replace uh, but, uh, uh, let, let me uh, let me ask you. Yeah. Uh, in case when we have a fixed finite number of uh, uh, persons in population, it seems that uh, it is um, Markovian process, uh, Markovian chain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can apply all uh, theorems uh, which are valid for Mar uh, Markov chain with finite number of states. Uh, so we actually, we know what to expect. Uh, exactly. So only, only question is how to interpret it uh, uh, in, this, in this case. Also yeah. in particular, when we, we, we know the objects which, should, which we should obtain, mm -hmm. but there are also usually the question, can we um, describe them explicitly in terms of the parameters uh, in the population? And so the number of relationships in the beginning and the number of individuals, or can we only find upper bounds or what's mm -hmm. the, the quantitative part? Mm -hmm. Because usually the, the transition matrices which we obtain are not, in a, in, not explicit in a way that we can easily look for spectral gaps or anything like that. It, it's mm -hmm. a usually a very intricate way of uh, writing down these matrices and calculating eigenvalue is usually is not approachable. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's the difficulty. That it's it, it seems very intuitive and all the mark theory applies, but only in a qu uh, qualitative way. And so we are looking for a way to get quantitative um, okay. numbers in there. And. So the, the idea is to, to exactly write down all these things explicitly. And a possible way to get this is to go from this graph of four individuals with the four relationships to a bigger state space, which we want to describe uh, explicitly, where the edges become particles in some sense. And the setting that is appropriate for this is a so-called line graph, which represents all possible edges in a graph. So here we start with our four vertex graph and go to a line graph, which represents three, four, which could be an edge in, in this population of four individuals, one, three, and so on. And now we can go a step further and look which edges do exist in the initial graph. So for example, four, two, and we place a particle on this side where the edges have no direction. So two, four and four, two are identical. This leads to, sorry, to a number of um, <clears throat> possible new interpretations where this is now a configurations, a configuration of K particles on a new graph which has also a particular structure. And the initial parameters translate very nicely to the setting in a line graph. So we can always derive from a line graph back the initial parameters. So talking about line graph or the initial graph really doesn't change much um, in terms of the information, except that now we have this particle interpretation. So what can we do with this? Well, um, we have particles on a graph. Um, particles, because of the interpretation as edges, can only exist uh, mutually exclusive. So we can't have two edges uh, between the two identical individuals. So two particles here cannot sit on the same side. <clears throat> And the movement that I described beforehand 
works exactly along these edges in this graph. And this is, in the end, a certain type of exclusion process um, where I take the definition of an exclusion process very, very broadly. So an exclusion process is really the idea that we can only have um, one particle at a, sign, uh, at a time on one side. And <clears throat> an important object for a graph when we consider exclusion processes is always the neighborhood of one particle. And so um, the neighborhood is just defined for one vertex as all the other vertices in the graph for, for which we have an edge between the vertex and the other one. <clears throat> and now we can define a certain kind of exclusion process on a simple connected graph as a typical way um, as it is done in statistical mechanics by writing it as a vector of zeros and ones um, such that we have exactly one entries which are one which represent the uh, positions of each particle at, at each time and, and the zeros represent open spaces. Now we define the transition uh, between two time steps since we are in discrete time by just drawing in a certain way. And this is the, the mathematical way to describe it, which we uh, use especially to fix our um, distributions. So in the beginning, we draw uniformly a particle. Then one particle, uh, one uh, <clears throat> side, which is in a neighborhood of said particle, but which is not occupied. And then we replace the initial side with the new one. That, that's the abstract definition. But maybe it's easier to, to look at it in in the sense of how we, we define the dynamics. So the, the idea was to replace edges with particles in a different graph. So we had this way of defining the dynamics in the beginning. And on the line graph, we now start by picking a vertex, which is occupied. In this case, the vertex 1, 3. And then we move it to another side, which happens here. So basically, we draw this vertex, then uniformly one of the sides adjacent to this side, which is not occupied, so 3, 4, or 1, 2, and then move our particle, which again uh, remains rather easy as a, as a perspective. <clears throat> And that's all I, I wanted to, to set in the definition. And the idea is now to really go in, into, the, into the Markov setting uh, by finding some canonical representation of this exclusion process in some sense uh, of, of configurations on the, on the line graph. And that's something that has been done uh, before by Yakunis, for example, by defining a new graph which consists as vertices of subsets of the initial graph, which we call V, where V, uh, the, the script Vs, everything that has a script form will now play the role of something that represents sets because we are going to consider Markov chains on uh, graphs with, where the vertice, vertices correspond to sets. And so these script small v are subsets of the initial vertex set, and they contain exactly k, the number of particles in there uh, as elements. And so they represent the occupied sites in our initial graph. And now to get the correct edges, so to describe uh, to have edges which really describe the transitions for our process, 
we look at a symmetric difference, which means we look at the difference between uh, the, the, the operation between two sets, such that we get as a result, the elements which are mutually exclusive in each set. So we can say that the a symmetric difference of a script V and a script W is a set of a small V, which is an element of script V and a small W, which is an element of W. And the important thing we have to enforce is that these two elements here define again an edge in the initial graph. If we don't look uh, if we don't have this constraint here, we run into the problem that basically um, <clears throat> particles move can, move can move everywhere. And that's something we wanted to avoid. We, we want to allow particles not to jump everywhere, but only in the neighborhood within the initial graph. And <clears throat> This can also be written as a group, group theoretic um, object in, in terms of the symmetric group. But I, I, I like to, to stay in this um, way of thinking about it because it yields a certain clarity when it comes to the formulas later on. And what we can see when we define these graphs based on just a, a certain initial graph, that the LK, so the script LK, which we define in, in this sense, has a very nice symmetric structure. It's something that is quite uh, astonishing when we first look at it, but when we keep in mind that there is a group theoretic representation and interpretation, it becomes less of a, <clears throat> less of a surprise. In this case, I took a graph L, which was six regular. So each vertex has the degree six. And we have 10 vertices. And we place three particles on this graph. And we obtain this LK as the state space of all possible configurations and their transitions. And now having defined this graph, we can find a representation for eta k, which really is a Markov chain, because it's quite complicated to interpret, or it's not directly possible to interpret eta k quantitatively as a Markov chain. So to write down a transition matrix, and that, that's the goal. We want to see a transition matrix to understand as much as possible about the quantitative behavior. And having found the state space, it's quite direct that we can find <clears throat> a corresponding probability space, which we call omega prime, f prime, and p prime, on which we can define a Markov chain having the state space LK, such that the probabilities are basically the same. We define it just uh, point by point, and it's something that has been done uh, for a long time. There, there is nothing um, incredibly exciting about it. It's basically just find the right state space, and then you can, can, can write this down. And the right state space in this uh, context is a, is a state space which allows us to say something about the transition matrix which we call PK delta, where the delta represents the uh, symmetric difference of two sets, because this is the, the central object which we're looking for. In this case, which has also uh, this, this has been discussed by the Econists, for example, in, in the 90s, um, you, you can start by defining any kind of exclusion process. You, you can do um, exclusion processes in any kind you wish uh, by changing the transitions and then trying to write down um, transition matrices, 
or you can write down transition matrices of configurations and then go back and try to find an interpretation in terms of exclusion processes on a graph. So you can go back and forth. And now the, the question is, what have we in our context of these um, social science motivated processes, which hasn't been done before? Because it's, it's really a topic, exclusion processes, which has been researched really for, for ages. It's something that's not new in a mathematical community. So what have the, the, the models motivated by social sciences that add something to the discussion? And to get to that point, let's first consider the, the classical exclusion process um, motivated usually by uh, statistical physics, theoretical particle physics, um, which for which the, the basic um, work was done by Diagnos and Salof Kost in the, uh, in the 1990s, um, for which they basically found that if you take a simple connected graph and then allow uniformly any particle to move um, between sides. So basically, you could have two particles which switch sides, where you can have no restriction on how the particles move. They, they move, and if they meet, they just exchange places. It's a very physics-motivated um, approach that the two particles, for example, can crash into each other and then jump back to their side. So there are, are various interpretations which lead to this formula. Um, which basically means that if you take a configuration, which we call script V, then you transition to another script W if you only differ in one particle position. That's the idea that in each time step, we only move one particle. Um, but you choose really just among the edges. So the degree represents uh, the number of edges adjacent to a vertex. And so for each vertex in the, v, in the script V, we basically just draw uniformly among all possible edges. So there, there's not much of a consideration of individual behavior. It's uh, very homogeneous. Every particle has the same right um, proportional to its degree. And then you get only this, this normalization term to have, a, <clears throat> um, to have a transition probability that adds up to one. The idea or the, the, the object that one can introduce here is a so-called um, vertex-induced subgraph of a subset of our vertex set which basically amounts to the graph, which consists of V as a vertex set and the edges which contain endpoints which are included in the script V. So we reduce our graph and we keep all the edges which do not point out of our script V. These are the, the edges which in the exclusion process are blocked. So that means, um, because the script V describes a particle configuration, edges between vertices in script V um, are, are edges between occupied vertices. And so moving particles on these edges does not work because both ends are occupied. So that's. And, but, as I mentioned before, the, the process which we consider does not choose uniformly among all edges and then just moves a particle, but it chooses first an individual or a relationship and then changes the, the relationship. And the difference here is that we get a very different behavior for, for this transition matrix. 
And that's, that was our, our first result um, with Patrick Cartier at the Toulouse University. That when we consider um, the particle system in used by the <coughs> uh, dynamics on our social network, then we get transition probabilities, which look very different than what we had uh, in the case of the physics motivated <coughs> example. In particular, we get a rather heterogeneous transition probability, where now the vertex V, which is responsible for the transition, so the, the actual state or the actual side from which a particle wants to leave, plays a role in the transition probability. So it's not only the object V here, which defines the transition probability, but the particle itself, which was not the case in the physics motivated example. And then again, we get uh, the normalization, or not normalization constant, but uh, the term to stay in place, which then adds everything up to one to get a transition probability. The question is now, if we have this, does it change much? Because actually, if you look at it, then in, in the order of how this, this behaves, it, it's not so different because here we have a sum in the case of uh, the physics interpretation, we have a sum of K summons and they are all in terms of the degree here. So if all the degrees were equal, um, it would be one over K times some degree. And we get also here this one over K and the degree minus some some term, which looks like it, it should behave uh, almost identically. It, it's something that um, from, from the first look at it really looks very similar. And so let, let's compare the, the classic or the, the results for, for the classical example um, with what we found in, in our uh, process. So we call the the Markov chain uh, motivated by the physics example, um, sigma dSCK, which is the um, as for the initials uh, from the first paper, and consider a graph which is regular. So every vertex has a degree V bar. And so we obtain for the transition probabilities to go from a script V to a script W just a uniform distribution. It's irreducible, aperiodic, reversible. It's, it's just a, a simple random walk that there's nothing interesting there. So you, you, can, you can write down everything you want. And uh, as soon as you have this, this transition matrix, you, it's an, it's an ex exercise for, for students. But now if we look at our process, um, there, there should be a D bar here. Then you still keep the, the side V, which is occupied as a term which influences your transition probabilities. And this is due to the fact that in the initial model, we choose only among the relationships which do not exist. So we have an additional constraint, which is not in the physics model, because in the physics model, you can have two particles that crash and jump back. So you, you can have like an imaginary jump where you don't see a, a real difference, but in the transition probabilities it is accounted for it. But we constrain ourselves to the case that you cannot have uh, two individuals which try to have a second relationship that, that doesn't make much sense. So you get an additional constraint. That does not influence irreducibility, of course, because um, we still keep positive uh, transition probabilities on every possible edge in this case. Additionally, a periodicity also remains uh, untouched, which is also not surprising. And so we have ergodicity and 
the, the convergence to an equilibrium distribution. But in turn, we do not have reversibility. And that's something that, that's, that's quite surprising that you, you look at it and you think it, it shouldn't not, why should it change reversibility? And furthermore, it's in the general case, completely unknown to us how the, the stationary distribution looks like. And we're going to see why it poses such a problem to, to say something about the stationary distribution. But first, let's look at the reversibility, because it's something that, for, especially for convergence speed, is a nice thing to have. If, if you have reversibility, then everything is fine. And the, the question really lies in, or the answer lies in the, the respect of the graph structure. The process we define, we defined, respects a lot more in the local graph structure of the graph L, while the physics um, motivated example does not care too much about it because there, there is a lot more, um, it's, it's a lot more homogeneous in its transition probabilities. And the, the example for which um, it's, it's quite easy or it's, it's possible to see why reversibility does not hold are graphs which contain what I defined as a tri star. So we have a, a subgraph which has six uh, vertices, um, three on an inner circle and three on an outside circle. The, all the, the three tau vertices form a complete graph of three vertices and the beta i are only connected either to another beta or to a tau with the same index. It's not allowed to have a beta that is connected, so beta two cannot be connected to tau three. If you find this in a, in a graph, which, is, which happens quite often, which is not something that, that's really rare, uh, because this just describes you have three people who know each other, you can inter interpret it like this if you want, and the, each person knows someone else, which is unknown to the two person, two other persons in the group. That, that's something that happens almost all the time. Um, and you, you consider this exclusion process we defined on a graph which contains such a dry star, then the implied Markov chain on LK is only reversible if and only if either you have one particle two or n bar minus two or n bar minus one where n bar was the number of uh, sites we had in L. So the number of vertices in L. That means your process is reversible uh, if you have one or two particles. So basically your graph is empty. There are basically no particles uh, which move around or your graph is almost full because you have occupied all sides except for one or two with particles. And these are rather uninteresting cases because we, we are wondering about uh, well, what happens in a typical case. So when we have like half the sides occupied or maybe a third. And in these cases, we can show just by finding such a tri star in your graph that you will not have reversibility in, in this, for this, this abstract Markov chain. <clears throat> how how can, can we show that? Basically, you, you construct a three particle counter example and you use Kolmogorov's criterion. So the idea that the <clears throat> that for any path, you have to have the same probability to go in one direction than in the other to have reversibility. And that if that's not the case, then you don't have reversibility. And you start with a configuration which looks like this. And basically you move around in a way that looks more or less innocent 
So you move from tau one to tau three, then uh, from tau two to beta two, then back from tau three to tau one, and then from beta two to tau two. What's, what's the, the idea behind this? Well, if we look at it backwards, yeah, sorry, that was too fast. Then we see that the move from tau two to beta two does quantitatively, quantitatively not change the neighborhood of the particle which moved from tau two to beta two. It still has one side in its neighborhood which is not occupied and one side which is. So in terms of its situation for transition probabilities there, there is not much change. Then tau, the particle from tau one moves to tau three. Um, again, is there a change? But now we have to respond with yes, because before we had one neighbor in this case, and now it, sorry, moves to a neighborhood where there are no particles which occupy neighboring sites. Tau one, tau two, and beta three are all non-occupied. So this move here changes something for the particle. Then beta two, uh, the particle from moves from beta two to tau two, which again does not change its, its neighborhood in, in a quantitative sense, because again, it has one occupied neighbor. And then tau three moves back to tau <clears throat> one, which again changes its neighborhood. So the, the idea is to now compare whether these, these changes in the neighborhood in one direction and the other imply a imply um, that the, the product of the transition probabilities in one sense or in the other are not the same. And indeed that's the case if we have the, the conditions in the theorem, which are very broad and apply to almost all realistic networks. Now the, the idea, what could that mean for, for our um, social science interpretation is that moving out of a crowded neighborhood is more probable than moving back into this specific neighborhood. So if you look at the, the tau one particle here, that's exactly what we do. We move it out of a, of a very occupied neighborhood, then something changes and moves back into the same neighborhood which is now smaller. And so the, the transitions to, to go back to the same configuration changes just by the, the idea that the transition probabilities fundamentally depend on the neighborhood of each particle which moves. And this is not the case for classical exclusion processes as defined by Diakonis. That, that's something that is, is not um, accounted for in these models. And this is the, the contribution which can be seen coming from the social sciences to include this idea of having, having a choice where you can decide or where each particle has a decision to make depending on its um, neighborhood where it wants to move. Let's go uh, deeper into the, the social conflict model or um, social network model interpretation um, to get a, a real feel of what that means. And in this setting, we have the advantage that we are talking about uh, so-called strongly regular graphs. So graphs which have a certain number of vertices and bar, each vertex has a number of um, neighbors, which is constant, which we call D bar. Then we have a, another condition, which is given by two parameters, alpha and beta, which basically implies that any two vertices have a constant number of common vertices when they are adjacent or not. And where the number of common vertices of two adjacent vertices is given by alpha and the number of two vertices, uh, the number of common neighbors of two vertices which are not adjacent is given by beta. An example, or to go back to the example from the beginning, we have a graph 
with four vertices. And then we consider the line graph. And indeed, in general, or always, line graphs are so-called strongly regular graphs, where each parameter is given as a function of the number of vertices if the initial graph is a complete graph. So we start with a complete graph. We are wondering about its line graph, and we always get a strongly regular graph. And as you may recall, in the beginning, the idea was to go from an initial graph and the relationships to its line graph and particles on this line graph. So now in this case um, of four vertices, for example, you see that every vertex in the line graph has four neighbors. There are exactly six of them. And if you then look at the remaining parameters, that every two connected vertices, for example, three, four, and one, three, have four minus two, so two common neighbors, which are in this case <clears throat> four, one, and two, three. And this indeed gives a, a very explicit way now to say something about the behavior of, of these um, relationships when we only consider line graphs. Because the corollary can just be uh, used directly from the, the theorem, since every strongly regular graph, which allows for at least one common neighbor of two adjacent vertices, implies that there is such a tri star included in it. So basically, the, the strongly regular graph always satisfies the conditions in the theorem. What does this apply now, uh, imply for the, the relationship uh, process we wanted to analyze uh, in the beginning? And that's the second uh, corollary, which basically states that if, a, if we have a population of n individuals and k relationships, then the associated Markov chain is reversible if and only if either the population has size three, so we have a population of three people, which is not all uh, too interesting, or everybody um, is almost a stranger to everybody, so basically you know no one in your network, or almost everybody knows almost everybody, so you, you, no matter how large your a network is, you know um, almost everyone, which again is not really a uh, typical example, because usually you know some fraction, um, or in, in some cases, maybe the, the number of individuals you know, follow, follows, know um, follows a, a power law, but you will never have the cases where you only know two individuals or almost everyone, that that's not realistic. So, you, you can go to the, the interpretation for these, these social networks and the relationships which change within. And basically, the, the concept um, of Kolmogorov's theorem or Kolmogorov's tri tri criterion serves really well here because it tells us that when we start from a certain set of relationships, then to go back to the same set of relationships depends highly on how, uh, in which order relationships are dissolved and recreated. So if you have some preferred uh, group of friends and you see that it starts to change and you want to bring it back and you want to maximize the probability to recreate the same group of friends, then you should be highly cautious in which order you uh, remove and add relationships, because that could really uh, add to the, the difficulty of recreating the group or keeping it apart. <clears throat> and so this gives a very impressive example, in my opinion, that there is something new to these, these processes. It's not just... Uh, Sorry, another question. Uh -huh. Okay, you can continue. Okay. Um, 
Um, yeah, that, uh, sorry, uh, what was I? Um, yeah, that this, this process really adds something new in, in terms of the, their behavior. And it's not just uh, an interpretation of very old processes that are well known already in mathematics. Now, when we look at this, this tri star, at this object, which uh, was our problem, let's say, for the reversibility, then we realize that it's, it does never exist in bipartite graphs. So in graphs which have two groups, and these two groups are interconnected but not intraconnected. And so we might wonder, OK, if we have a, a bipartite graph, maybe we can save something in terms of reversibility. In terms of our in interpretation for the social sciences, in return, it's not very helpful because the implied dynamics, which we looked at in the beginning, never yield bipartite graphs. That that's just not possible. But nonetheless, when we think about it, you see <clears throat> bipartite graphs as an example for two uh, parallelized server networks where you have packages which are sent from one side to the other randomly and every package represents a, a particle and so every server is occupied if there is a particle and if to, uh, if one server wants to send a particle to an already occupied server, that's not possible. So you, you could find a, an interesting interpretation also when considering exclusion processes on bipartite graphs, especially also using the, um, using the transition probabilities we proposed, since the servers should only choose between available servers and not all of them to reduce the number of times you uh, try to access an already occupied server. And indeed, when we look at bipartite graphs, um, we can find that the Markov chain is reversible. And also we find a very explicit stationary distribution which is given in terms of the balance of the two <clears throat> um, parts of the bipartite graph. So in the sense that we look at the particles uh, on one side and the particles on the other side, we consider which one of these is uh, minimal and can write down an explicit expression for the transition uh, for the stationary distribution, which only depends on these balances. And so the in, in the long run, you could see here <clears throat> the the balance between two sides of the network where you send back and forth uh, packages. <clears throat> How can we how can we prove this um, very explicitly? The idea is to define an equivalence relationship on the graph uh, script LK in a in a way that two uh, two sides are equivalent if sorry their their degrees there should be a degree here if their degrees in this graph are the same. Why is that useful? Um, the degree captures, the, the degree in this graph captures both the degree in the initial graph and the degree um, in the subgraphs. So the subgraphs, which I defined before, um, which imply the, the occupied edges. And the straightforward way to now prove or do the proof is to show that the induced mark of or the induced process on 
now a quotient graph, so where we identify sides if they are equivalent under this equivalence relationship, we show that this is a Markov chain, which is a, a method called lumping, um, where you reduce the state space and you want to see whether or not you keep the Markov property. And the, in this way of lumping the state space, so combining states, gives us again a state, uh, gives us again a Markov chain. And in particular, in this case, the quotient graph is a path. And the previously very complicated uh, Markov chain becomes a nearest neighbor a symmetric random walk where you basically only have to calculate the transition probabilities and then you have your, your um, stationary distribution explicitly. And this gives a general idea what we can do, especially when we, to define this, um, this quotient graph here, it's, it's not very difficult. You just look whether two vertices have the same degree and you lump them together. And if it's a path, then you get a reversibility if you have at the same time a Markov chain. So it's a good indicator is to see whether or not this quotient graph is a path. And that's something that's very easy to check. And the second thing is to look, and that's the hard part, whether or not the, the induced process is a Markov chain. And if that's the case, we get both the stationary distribution and the reversibility basically for free. So this is a tool which allows us to analyze these kinds of graphs and these kinds of Markov chains very easily and rather rapidly. But of course, this is not uh, the, the end. This is just the beginning. We now have uh, the the fact that we have convergence, but no reversibility. And so the, the questions arise, OK, how fast does all of that converge? And in the reversible cases, that's quite easy. We can use classical results. But in the case, in the case which we are interested in, especially for the social networks, we don't have reversibility. And only the fact that it does converge, but also no um, explicit uh, stationary distribution. So the convergence speed to get more quantitative insights is the, the next step, um, which I'm working on right now, to get a holistic view on, on how fast this happens. Then the next step would be almost uh, for aesthetic reasons also to find the explicit stationary distribution for non-reversible cases. So that it should be feasible, but it's uh, not so easy to find it in, in a very completely explicit way. In a, in a way that's so explicit that I can write it down as a formula which only depends on the parameters with which I started. Then the next step is, of course, to compare quantitatively the classical exclusion process with the induced one. Because if the classical exclusion process is not so far in a to be defined sense from our process, then the additional work we have to do is really not worth it. If we can basically say, OK, the, the classical exclusion process still captures quantitatively what our process does, then why bother do the extra work and not only consider the classical exclusion process and then go back to the initial model and maybe wonder about an interpretation of the classical exclu exclusion process in that case. And then the last part is the to compare also the hydrodynamic limits to look at the the hydrodynamic limit for the classic exclusion process, which is something that has been analyzed very well. And then to try to find one for, for our process and then compare these two if the third point is not feasible in particular. So to 
at the tool of hydrodynamic limits to say something about the, the difference or the similarity of the two processes in a quantitative way. And that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm open to questions and remarks. Thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, maybe somebody have uh, questions or uh, comments, please. Uh, okay, uh, I have uh, some questions uh, related uh, to this uh, Diakonis model, because you mentioned that uh, it has more relationship with physics. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, at least uh, if you want to compare hydrodynamic limits, uh, you can think about the stationary distribution as about something like a Hibbs measure uh, or the measure which uh, minimize some energy functional. Yeah. Uh, so from this point of view, it is interesting to uh, have some functionals uh, from the uh, state uh, which uh, uh, you can uh, analyze and uh, uh, already check uh, the behavior. Uh, maybe you already did this? No, not yet. That, that's something I'm, uh, I hope to do now. So I just uh, arrived in Germany and that, that's one of the projects I want to do here, mm -hmm. um, but not yet. Uh, because uh, today you presented us only some, uh, can I say, combinatorical methods uh, to study this uh, picture. Uh, but uh, it, it will be interesting to understand uh, the, uh, this dynamic from the uh, point of view of uh, statistical physics. Yeah. Uh, so also uh, another way uh, of investigation can be uh, uh, useful. This is the relationship with the uh, measure valued processes of constant mass. Uh, because uh, you have uh, the process, you have uh, the mass distribution of your particles on the all graph. And uh, this uh, mass distribution uh, have constant mass. Uh, so uh, it, it will be interesting to look for the model of uh, for uh, such measure valued process of constant mass. And from this point of view, it, I think that uh, in the book of Ellison Etheridge on me yeah. measure valued processes, you, you can find some uh, even combinatorical models which leads to measure valued process. So maybe it will be useful. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the next comment. And the last one is the following. Uh, you said uh, uh, that uh, you study uh, reversibility from the point of view that uh, after you have it, uh, it is uh, good to study stationary distribution and uh, conversions to this distribution. Uh, but also uh, there is a notion of so-called dual process and uh, sometimes you don't need to have reversibility. You, you can just uh, define dual process and then uh, you can uh, produce uh, something uh, similar. Yeah, I looked at that. Um, the, so if we, we look our, at our mark chain here. Um, it becomes quite uh, challenging, I would say, to integrate the this very local view in, into a dual process, it, it leads to, let's say, uh, rather str strange uh, interpretations or so rather strange terms. Um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, okay. it's, it's an idea I, I would like to, to pursue. It's something that, um, I haven't done yet because the, the focus on the interpretation um, was very strong so far. So the, the idea to, to find something that is really interpretable, interpretable um, was basically at the center of my work up mm -hmm. to this moment. Mm -hmm. I see.
Okay, okay. Uh, it is uh, it is interesting, and uh, uh, when you will have uh, something about the uh, hydrodynamic limits, it will be uh, good to, to visit us again, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, today we finish our work, uh, and uh, Georgi, maybe you know who will be the next speaker. Jana uh, Kinderknecht. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, see you see, see you ne next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.